On this week's episode of the Investors Corner, we welcome Stephen Gear. Stephen is director and joint owner of Red Roots Property in Yorkshire. Together with his brother Matthew, they have grown a full service property company. So end to end to their investors, they source, refurbish, refinance and rent properties on behalf of their clients. Something that an out of area investor could only dream of. So to hear how they've done that and how they walked a mile in the investor's shoes before launching their business, let's listen to Stephen's story. Stephen, thanks for joining us on our fancy new platform. So we've all got our fingers crossed just below the camera that uh, that the recording goes well today uh, because 99% of our pods, as you know, are recorded in our studio. We're on Riverside FM trying to record a long distance podcast today. Steve, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Good. We've got two thirds of the crew. We've got Andy and Stephen both absolutely wiped out with a little bit of cold and flu. So I've I've uh, I've kept myself hidden in the podcast room while, while Andy's away from me. So there was a quick intro to Stephen uh, earlier, but Stephen, with his brother Matthew, own Red Roots property in the Pontefract area of Yorkshire, so quite a long way from us, uh, both geographically and accent-wise. Um, Ian, myself and Andy have worked with Stephen and Matthew on a couple of projects over the last year, and what we want to do is show the differences, the pros, the cons, and the benefits and the drawbacks of taking your money up the M40 or the M1 and depositing it in the north of England. Um, Is the northern powerhouse what it's cracked up to be? Should you be buying properties in the north or should it be left well alone for those who know what they're doing? So, Steve, thanks for joining us. Uh, can't wait to debunk a couple of the uh, the myths and the uh, the sales tactics that go on, whether it's a good, bad, or ugly thing to do. But we're going to start with something you sent me um, earlier this week: a rental investment uh, on your high street to give people an example of what's available, why it's available, and um, why you think it's a a good proposition for people. Yeah, I think locally for where we are, again, just sort of sort of honing and sort of geographically where we are speaking from. So in between sort of Pontefract, Doncaster, Barnsley and Wakefield, there's little suburbs of villages and that's sort of where we find ourselves. So we're not necessarily necessarily sort of nestled into the specific town centres, but rather that sort of niche area in the middle, which poses a nice opportunity really for the people where it's spilling out from the growth within the city centres but then you wouldn't necessarily be searching on right move for the village that we operate in, which is great in many ways. But normally when people are looking for our village, it normally comes with a search of Leeds plus 30 miles or something like that. So within that, obviously, as you can imagine, you're going to bring up a load of properties uh, and then all of a sudden it gets diluted down to what actually might be suitable for someone. So having someone like ourselves where we're down on the ground, it's really just sort of peeling back the curtain as to what the opportunities are and saying, oh, that, you know, it's not just a, a void in the map. There are villages, trading businesses and a decent rental side. So, yeah, it's uh, the commercial one that I'd sent through. That was quite a typical one, really, uh, sort of what you could get really on the high street. I know a lot of people say the high street's dead. Uh, I personally feel that high, the high street isn't dead, but rather it's just looking to change uh, and evolve as well. As we all seem to know, with the you've got the the hairdressers in there, for example, down on the bottom, an Amazon proof business. It's always going to need to be there. Been there many years, established business, and then obviously the upstairs with the resi- residential flats, which as a market's pretty crazy right now. So, like you quite rightly said, the the first thing me and Andy quite often tell people is, if you're going to invest, invest in somewhere that you know or can do the research in. So. That leads to a lot of investors obviously buying within three miles of their front door because you quite rightly alluded to it. If I type West Yorkshire or Leeds plus 30 miles into Right Move or Zoopla, I'm going to get overwhelmed with with detail. So if you are putting together a investment for someone, whether it be residential or commercial in your area, what are the what are the equations? What do you what do you work by? Everyone seems to work out slightly different and, you know, I guess, you know, necessarily there's not necessarily a, a right or a wrong answer. 
for us, it's about the, the return on capital employed. So, of course, you've got your, your bog standard, your purchase price, stamp duty, legal costs, broker fees, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, things like your refurb and what have you. And then, obviously, we're working off a GDB figure looking to sort of refinance out with the, the model you'll be familiar with, the buy, rent and, buy refurbish, refinance uh, and rent out. So, in terms of actually, I think... From our point of view, a lot of people who are coming into the market, it's they've got modest budgets, but it's still that step on the ladder. You know, like you say, if you're talking three miles from probably anywhere in the south of England, then it can look uh, unaffordable to a lot of people. So then it's it feels like a big step up in the ladder just to try and get, for example, one buy to let, whether it be a flat or whatever, and that can be a big barrier event, a, a big barrier to entry. I think. From our point of view, like I say, it's just trying to shine a spotlight to say, look what you can get for your money up here. And if I had a pound for every time uh, an investor from down south come up to see us and said, wow, that's a big house for not a right lot of money, I'd be well on my way to saving for a next deposit. It's, you know, it, it you have to see it to believe it, I think, when you get used to the southern figures. So, uh, as I say, it's... Um, the, the rental demand's there, and if you've got a good sort of entry into the market, then... I guess why not really? I think that's probably more appropriate. Yeah, I think where we're based, you're, you're looking at six figures now. If you want to buy a buy to let, you need a hundred thousand pounds plus your fees in the bank. Your hundred thousand pounds is probably a deposit based on a forty percent deposit to make the rental calculations work. So it's quite a closed door to ninety percent of the public, I would guess. Not everyone's got £100,000 knocking around in their back pocket. Totally appreciate that. Um, so it's a, it's an opportunity. Now, what I've seen, and I don't know, uh, we can we can discuss this one, and Andy, throw your, throw your oar in, is capital appreciation down south and rental yield up north. True or false? What do we think? Some of the investors that I've spoken to recently are looking up that area because for what they can get for their money compared to down south which is what we've just sort of said when we the, the prices from up north compared to down south it's just a massive massive gap right um but rental yields up north i mean what what are we talking rental yield wise on a on average now for our specific area it's not uncommon to get your seven percents Okay, so seven seven percent's there, right? Yeah. It, it, down, down, down south, you're lucky right now to get four and a half, five percent. Okay, so again, it depends on your long term goal, right? With capital appreciation down south, I think you're going to see a lot more capital appreciation compared to up north because of the area that it's in and the type of people that are down south with, you know potentially higher salaries, better paid jobs, all of that sort of stuff, right? So again, it depends on your goal of, if your short-term goal is, right, get the income coming in, get the yield high, and then look to sell in a couple of years to invest that money into something else, then up north I would look at. But if it's long-term goal is to rent the property, keep it for 10 years or use it as my you know, pension further on down the line than you would do down south, wouldn't you? It just depends on what your goal is, how much money you've got currently, because like Mike said, you're going to need a, a hefty bit of cash, right, to get down south now to financially make it work for you. Um, as in up north, I might be able to get two or three properties for the same the same amount of money. So again, if it my personal thing would be that I'll try everything to do to invest down in, in the South because this is where I'm from and I'm comfortable with this market. I know what I'm going to get rental-wise. I know what I'm going to get yield-wise. I know what I'm going to get capital appreciation-wise. Up North, it's just something that I wouldn't look at because it's a distance away from me, right? And I, I like everything everything local but like i said many of the investors that i've spoken to right now for them financially because the additional costs that they've got now in renting a property and the extra things that they need to need to look at i know an investor that's just bought two properties up north and they've spent ninety thousand pounds on on those properties and mm -hmm. then they'll go and do them up and they'll rent them straight away because of the demand up 
up north. You know, you hear about rental prices right now, and the focus seems to be that you get a lot more for your money rental-wise, yield-wise, up north compared to down south because you've got high high demand up, up there. So, Stephen, going into bat for the north, um, the... I guess the preconceived idea Southerners have about the North is house prices never go up. Is that true or is that false or are we somewhere in the middle of finding uh, an exaggerated truth? I think, yeah, you, you don't have to look at any of the statistics over the last sort of 10 years to show that that is just categorically false. They, they do appreciate, perhaps just not in that sort of linear graph that we may all wish to plot our projections on. I think sort of rewinding way back from when my dad started in the property game back to the early 2000s. Obviously, we had quite a buoyant market right up to 2008. Obviously, we all know what sort of followed from there. And from there, we did have quite a, a lull. So I kind of get why the sort of the feeling, the stereotype is that the house prices sort of stagnate at best because it seemed like forever and a day that it was just never going to rise. You know, you've seen the property prices or at firstly in London, then down south, and it just seemed like we were the only place in the country where when's this capital growth going to hit us? And then as you get to sort of 2019, 2020 time, and they started to notice spurts that finally were going through, and obviously COVID just pours fuel on a fire, which brought you up really to where you should be if you were to draw that line of best fit. Except you've not just had it, like I say, as a linear sort of graph, you've just had a long period of stagnation and then sort of some significant growth. Now, I guess the, the, the talk on the streets from where I am is our price is going to drop and we're going to sort of see it sort of cool off to a degree. But when you're talking the house prices are what they are and the rents are how they are and the demand for that, you always feel like you've got that security from bringing the money from down south up in the north because as soon as the prices start to drop, the investors are like piranhas over them. So it's it's very hard to see that the properties are going to to drop significantly and if you've got that then obviously you've got that strong foundation to build on so yeah i would uh, refute the claim that you don't get any capital growth in the in the north i think my, my balanced opinion on it the, the world's changed slightly in the last four years that there's a huge amount of people who can work from anywhere so you don't have to just be in london and the southeast to do a job that's in london and the southeast we've both attended the same conference in london a couple of times it takes me about an hour and a half door to door to get there, the 30 miles uh, that it is. Um, and it takes you just over two to do 200 miles or whatever it is, 150 miles, which frustrates the hell out of me. Um, and, 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 and all the talk about Northern Rail not working when they want to come down here and try the, the, the rail line that I'm on. Um, so there's an element that people can be wherever they want to be now. And there's an element that people's money is a little bit more transient to, to go and do these kinds of investments. And I think 2008 did catch a lot of the North with its pants down in a sense because there'd been such massive development in a lot of the cities, in enormous apartment buildings, whether you're looking at Leeds, Huddersfield, wherever it might be. And, and that possibly caused an, an over exaggeration of the house price losses because people investors particularly had totally overspent on trendy apartments of sort of canal side refurbishment things which were they ever worth the money that people were spending on them in the first place did they just get totally ripped off in the early 2000s buying these apartments that were twice the price of a three-bedroom semi down the road so was it was it just terrible investing in in their in their place in the first place, and now things have balanced out a little bit. Possibly so. I know it's, uh, it's quite a good analogy, really. For example, uh, like I say investing locally. There was a, an an anomaly. Easy to say when you're not going to cold, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was an anomaly. I should have quit while I went ahead. Add an add an anomaly. For down south with my dad, uh, for example, he picked up a two-bedroom apartment in Bristol. Now, classic case, brought off plan, sort of, yeah, all looks nice, fine, shant, you know, he's thinking of diversifying, that sort of thing. So something a bit off the beaten track. Now, 
he really he got he fell into that trap that classic developers trap you know sell one off get your rich valuation for this property and oh look it's discounted it's off plan etc and the reality is when push comes to shove then it was never worth the value that was paid so now for a lot of years he thought he was in negative equity now sort of again coming out of that 2008 time it recovered a lot quicker than he realized because it was just it was rented out it wasn't no uh, no issues there was no sort of any ongoing maintenance so the year soon ticked by and then sure enough you're still thinking oh crikey well all the properties in the north have sort of stagnated so i'm probably still in the still in the negative equity with the with the flat in bristol then you ring up a couple of local estate agents and you realize wow <laughs> so that was the first sign a few years ago of how different things were but like i said i do feel like you've bridged that gap considerably sort of post-COVID. I just think that's accelerated what was going to happen anyway because of what you saw around you with the warehouses, with the employment. So, you know, everything was there for it. You look at Leeds as a big pinpoint, you look at Doncaster and all the infrastructure that's going there. You can't not be just like, wow, you know, the motorway networks, there's a lot of businesses benefiting from that. And, you know, you mentioned about like the, the freight uh, for like the rail industry and things like that. It's it's a lot more commutable than you think. You know, you mentioned me sort of door-to-door -door two hours. I could be into Doncaster a quarter of an hour from my house and it would be an hour and 30 from Doncaster to King London King's Cross, which all of a sudden you think, well, get your laptop out and before you know it, you pull it up and away you go, which if you're in a couple of days a week, then why would you not think about that? So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, the irony of me living in the UK's number one commuter town in Wokingham and it taking me an hour and 25 to get into Waterloo. Yeah, <laughs> blows your mind a little bit in in my opinion that you can get into London at the same time from Wokingham as Doncaster um, and that might wake a few people up who live in the south east just to say how connected it is when you pick the right towns or the right specific locations and I think that's key is not everything anywhere is ever going to go up but if you can see as some kind of public spending and this is a bandwagon we jump on every single time look at the public spending, look at the private investment that's going into a town. If that money is being spent, then house prices will at some point reflect that public and private spending that happens because that public and private investment money is not stupid money. It's there for a reason. So it's, it's a really important point. So Red Roots is something different to your standard estate agency um, from the perspective of a buy to let investor so we came across and we started working with yourself and, and matthew over the last year one thing that blew me away was the end-to-end -end service that that you guys have and there's a good reason why matthew's not on the podcast because he doesn't like to talk to people um but, <laughs> but he's very very good at doing other things so it'd be really good to understand if you're an investor coming from out of area and you engage with a company like Red Roots, and there'll be others out there, what you get and why? If we sort of just rewind sort of how our business was sort of built, like I say, going back to my dad being a wagon driver to you and the usual sort of DIY with the properties, so sort of getting them turned around, getting them rented out, and then going through that sort of aggressive period between 2000 to 2008 with the, the liquidity of finances and same day refinance, you could build up a quite a... A decent portfolio quite quickly which him and his cronies went round and did now that then led to the need for in 2011 a letting agency so it weren't coming at it from a fancy sales perspective or anything like that it was you graft hard you put up with the crap and then yeah you get a letting agency and sort of take on other people's stuff and that was the foundation for the initial block that we know we've got a shop front now we're on the high street we've got a letting agency and then as my brother was growing up he then went down the refurbishment point with regards to like the maintenance of the properties and things like that and then me sort of being okay in school it was like you could join the family business where you're not getting paid a lot of money and you're dealing with uh yeah lower end rentals all day it wasn't very attractive i must admit so my mum said no you're off to uni so did as i said so I went to uni i went into the nhs and from there that was when we started to recognize well we've got the letting agency we've got the refurbishment company which my brother was building at the time I'm now speaking with people in the NHS over lunch times and things like that saying, oh, I've always wanted to get into old and property, but for some reason they can't, whether just don't know how to or what's involved. And like I say, it's all these sort of preconceived uh, sort of 
limiting beliefs to a degree, but it's just you don't know what you don't know. It's property, it's bricks and mortar, it's secure, it's a secondary pension pot. But if they've no route to finding that investment, then you know it, it puts a lot of people off. So then we started doing a sourcing service whereby it'd be a case of we'd find a property, it could either be on market or off market. We would say you could purchase it for this, you could refurbish it for this, and it'll be worth X amount. And then obviously you can start talking about what it'll rent out for in cash flow and working out your return on investment, etc. So that's sort of how the the business evolved. Obviously, as you know, like we're trying to add the extra bolt on where we're trying to scale things out of the self-employed agents to feed that sort of, in effect, bring more properties there. And we feel like if you've got someone who's local in the village, is like I said, they're the ones who've got the down to the ground knowledge who can serve up properties where they're not on the market, which would be fantastic for the investors down south. And all of a sudden, you've got a seller who's happy because they've offloaded their property with no chain to a cash or a mortgage investor ready ready to go. They think getting the local lads working for the refurbishment side, we're keeping it as a rental thereafter, and also we've got a nice sort of smooth business model. So it's hitting the pain points of, from an investor point, thinking, how do I know which side of, well, even down to which side of the street do I need to invest on? Because they look identical, but let me tell you, there'll be some streets where you'd invest at that side, but not perhaps the other side. So you need that hyper-local knowledge to be almost treating it as if it's their own you know yes that looks fantastic it's an eight percent yield on paper but it's where your drug dealers meet on a friday evening i wouldn't recommend it you know it's that sort of stuff where when you got down on the ground knowledge and somebody was just going to tell you how it is look by all means crack on if you want to but i wouldn't buy it for x y and z reason so that's sort of where we sort of position ourselves and that's that's the key isn't it it's it's where people can't get their hands dirty because people can be reasonably cash rich and time poor and there's no way you can ever build that knowledge so every so often i'm signed up to all the auction lists and and all the buy to let investor marketing stuff and and i'll see this property is way way cheaper than everything else on the street but it's a wreck and i don't know why it's a wreck when I say a wreck, it needs a total refurbishment. Your kitchens, bathrooms, plastering, electrics, everything. But I can't go up there and do it. There's money in it. There's money in it for someone, but you've got to you've got to have some sort of network around you. So providing someone with an end to end is for an out of town investor is is what the industry, in my opinion, is crying out for because there's no way I can buy a house in Doncaster, look after it maintain it update it and rent it just kind of it cannot be done um and i would i would argue to an extent even with a traditional letting agency unless the property is prepared for them 99 percent of the time they're not going to do a great job at it it's just going to continuously drop in quality unless the property is prepared for them to an a1 standard which if you're a, if you're a couple of hours down the motorway you just cannot do for somebody so it's it's a really interesting business model to show that okay well we can find you the property one that we would buy we would put in our own portfolio and then we'll refurb it the way we would want it refurbished and then we would manage it the way we would want it managed um and it's something that should be really attractive to people so dipping back to the types of property you sent me a high street unit with a flat above um which we've all seen a million times before uh rental income 1100 a month so that's that's equivalent to a, a one bedroom house in 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 the region where we are believe it or not for a rental um but the difference between the lease like you said is firstly you've got a tenant for five years fixed and the tenant does a fully repairing lease so you're not going to get a phone call to say that something's tripped in the middle of the night and, and it's an emergency because the, the tenant looks after the building in its entirety. The second side of it is if I'm buying a one bedroom house, which is going to rent for £1,100 a month, Andy, I'm spending 275 on it, 275 plus, maybe even 300 in the southeast. How much am I paying for the freehold of this um commercial and resi unit 
Yeah, you, you mentioned the number 300. You'd be paid half that, which is just, like you say, because when we talk about like the the geography, it just, to, for me living here, it makes absolutely, well, very little sense to perhaps over leverage to go for the 300,000 one bed flat apartment house when you can just, like you say, you could potentially pick up two and double the rental income with that little bit of diversification whereby if there was a particular issue with one, you know, it, it it stacks financially. But as I say, when we speak with investors, it's not about the necessarily the, the cost per se, the numbers make sense, but rather it's the, but how do I know that's right? We know it's, you, they need that little bit of a, that trust uh, and you don't get that until you built that relationship as as we all know, like in this game. So, but that's the bit that I like, to be honest. It's about taking someone who's got very little knowledge and just serving it up on a plate and saying, look, these are your numbers, this is what you're looking at, you know, and if they want to then still invest in the South, then go for it, but at least open your mind to what options you do have available because, like you say, when you look, spell it out like that, it's, uh, it's a considerable difference. So, so if I've got 100k cash then, Stephen, where am I, what, what am I doing with it? Cause you, Andy's suddenly... done well out of Bitcoin in the last two weeks, Stephen, you might want to have a chat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll chat about that. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm getting sucked into the North thing now, right? Because I know 100k cash, like Mike said earlier, is not getting me a lot down here, down, down south. So I want to invest in, in other areas now and up north from what you're saying and the yields that you're getting. You know, it's interesting me. But yeah, 100k cash, what, what are you advising me? Where am I putting it? I guess it's uh, not to give a politician's answer, but it, I guess it does depend. You've got the one route, which would be sink it straight into sort of three properties, which are pretty much ready to go. You could be in for deposits, solicitor cost, stamp duty, etc. You could get three properties for that hundred k quite comfortably. What three pro- What three properties am I getting? Flats, uh, houses? Uh, no, three bed, three bed terrace houses. So uh, yeah, with the three bed semi markets, that bit more. And, but like I say, if you're thinking option one could be I could get three three bedroom houses which rent all day long, you're probably ready to let condition, if not just a minor refurbishment. You know, that's quite achievable. We could just view some properties, we could line them up and say, right, okay, well, realistically for them types of properties, you're probably gonna be circa seven hundred pounds per property for the rental side. So straight away from a gross rent point of view, you've got your hundred K cash, you've got two thousand one hundred coming in, and then however you whatever mortgage rates you can get. So that's one option, which some would go for. Uh, for example, myself, uh, Matthew, uh, we tend to go for, well, we've got 100K cash, so we're going to try to pick something up for the right sort of money. 80K, took 20 grand at it or so, and then we'll have a 120, 130, whatever, sort of that sort of region, and then look to refinance out and then spin it round. So one of the ways that we sort of grow our port- have grown our portfolio over the last couple of years was, again, going back to the the days with the NHS where people weren't quite ready to buy a property per se, but they loved the idea of a passive income. They liked the idea of the security of bricks and mortar. So then what we did was we would leverage their funds from themselves, give them the first charge security. We would cover the refurb costs and all the legal bits. And then when we've done the refurb, we've refinanced out and like with the traditional mortgage setup, we then can pay that investor back. So obviously then we've got, we've left the deposit in there, but we've pretty much just, we, we, we've cash flowed it from a perspective that we've not had to tie up that initial purchase price. So there's a couple of different ways depending on what you're trying to do. But for us, it was always about let's leverage up to pretty much the maximum 75% loan to value. I don't think we're particularly playing with fire at that, but we're happy to just keep spinning it round and then just roll it into the next one. And if we can use someone else's money, then obviously then there's there's opportunities with that, within that albeit they are less so since the interest rates uh, got a little bit better for savers. So you sort of two different options depending on what you're trying to achieve, but uh, options still rather than just one property in a certain location. There was was one point that I took amongst the many that you just made was you're still investing buy to let at 25% deposit. Now, I can't find an, a mortgage broker in the south of England who can find a mortgage product that works at 25%. So buy-to-let investors, the occasional one will fit the maths, but generally speaking, buy-to-let investors are forced to, to put down 40 more often than not, right, Andy? It just doesn't financially work at 25, 25%. You're not going to get it. 
So when you said that, I was like, oh, right, okay. So that's, you can financially make it work maybe up, up north then. But yeah, down south, you just it, the mass doesn't work out. I know banks like to be quite secure with the stress testing and that sort of thing. But like I said, because of the rental growth that we've experienced, there is enough margin. Like with, like I said, the whole portfolio sits at about 71%, 72% because we've just got a couple where the, the value has increased, but we've just not come around to, to refinancing. But that's interesting. So I've sort of take it for granted, really, with the sounds of it with the all 25% deposits. I thought I still feel hard done by when I speak to me. Dad and he talks about. Well, they only put ten percent down and all this, and oh, Jesus, <laughs> it was easier, wasn't it? Yeah, it they had was. a free ride. These oldies, absolute free ride. Um, all the you know buying properties for pocket change and not and borrowing all the money and it was so it's hard right. for us, <laughs> us young lads. But you know we'll get through it. <laughs> Stephen, what are your predictions for the for the rest of this year? We we've got. In the South right now, we've had probably the best, longest short period of sustained normal market <clears throat> that we've had in a long time. And I don't know if that's reflected where you are as well and whether you think that's going to carry on or uh, is that is that st- sort of stability about to burst? I, I, I too think it's going to be quite stable for this year. I think, like I say, there's some cause for optimism for what we've seen through the agency in terms of the first time buyer and investor market at the beginning of the year. Obviously, we know how that feeds then through it to the people looking to upsize and what have you, which will be nice because the, the things that we've got on our, the stock that we've got on our books that tends to be sticking around a little bit longer is that 400,000 plus, which up here is a nice big fire bed detached on a decent plot of land. So that's the sort of where people just need to. Keep working it through. Interestingly, we did have a couple of viewers at the weekend, actually, from people from your end, which are looking to bridge that gap between the retirement side. So sell the house in the south, get the nice big house up in the north. If they're visiting family, it's a quick trade journey. With the remaining equity, they can sink it into a couple of buy-to-lets locally, and then they'll bridge that gap from a cash flow cash flow perspective as they sort of dial down their working hours. So, yeah, I feel like, yeah, you're still getting that benefit sort of post COVID of that's like you mentioned it again earlier, the transient side of it where it's less of a divide, but rather, oh, well, that's just, you know, like I said, jump on a trip and do it all that, you know, every other month with the business, you spend the day in London, you do the show and you're back by the evening. It's a press. So you've had a day out of the, uh, in London. So you different option. Stephen, it's been awesome having you on the, the chat. I'm going to hold Andy back from booking a ticket while we discuss what the plan is. <laughs> He's an impetuous soul. So we get, we, it's it's really, really good to hear a second opinion based on different things because maybe one time too many, we say only ever buy where you know. Maybe the message should be buy where you can find a really reliable connection who can give you that trust and that support where you where you are and what fits the bill from an investment perspective because... We're, we're very much in the same country, but it's a very, very different investment model, as you've just explained. So really appreciate your time on the podcast. As ever with these podcasts, Stephen and Matthew from Red Roots Details will be attached in the show notes. They'll welcome your call or your WhatsApp with uh, open arms to answer any question that you've got about the benefits, pros and cons of doing what they've done uh, and succeeding at it. So as ever from another episode of the investors corner thanks for joining us and we'll hear you or see you next week